want to just start off by saying my name is Ajamal Binding. I'm the chair of the board of Movement in Omaha for Race Equity, which has been around for over 10 years. And in the last four to five years, we've gotten much more involved in race issues, uh, anti-racism, book discussions, as well as community forums and things like that. So we're kind of excited to bring folks together for, the, for this book. Uh, my co-host today is uh, Lindy Lomp <laughs> Lindsay Lombard is going to be talking a bit about uh, her perspective. And one of the ways that I want to throw out is that she initially approached me some months ago. She was moved by this book, Lindsay, and she said, oh, Jamal, you got to read this book. And uh, matter of fact, to show you how kind and gracious she was, she went out and bought it and mailed it to me. So it forced me to read it. And I was equally impressed with the book as she was. And at some point, we got to talking about, let's have a book discussion on it related to the other ones that we do and so on. And so she's going to be kind of like co-facilitating with me as well as me and her are going to kind of do a tag team where we interview each other because we were really moved by that. Uh, we also have on, on the set, I know Karen, one of our board members read and she loved it and uh, really wanted to push it a little bit more out the community. So that, hey, let's say, let's go forward with this. Uh, but without much further ado, I just want to give a little bit of overview and then we can get into the uh, back and forth between Lindsay and I. The format tonight is that we will talk for probably close to 30 minutes or 25 minutes, and then we're going to throw it out to the audience or to the participants to raise some of their concerns. Lindsay also has put together some questions that she'd like for you to consider for those of you who may not have questions or comments uh, to bring you into the conversations. We know that this is a thought-provoking book. We see there's a lot of reverence to what relevance to what we do here in Omaha and in Nebraska, so we're excited about it. But the write-up we, we talked about initially, it's written again by a Native American, uh, Ager, uh, Ager Vince Lueva, who is also a Native American, his name is Hispanic, and he talks about the donor community and the inequalities and what happens in our communities related to white supremacy, the savior complex, and also internalized oppression. Um, he challenges us, the author, uh, Ager, challenges us to learn about the dark realities of donor community as well as how we can deal with the historical damages that have been done to our respective communities of color. And some of us have been talking about reparations, enslavement, and so on. So this book fits right in there. Um, we hope that you get a chance to kind of uh, make this book come alive by doing something in our community afterwards. And so that's part of that. And just want to say a little about Lindsay. I know she's kind of a humble person, but uh, she's been a part of our Malcolm X book series. And she's also been a part of some of our, our uh, other uh, activities. She has extensive social justice work experience. She lives in Lincoln. Uh, she's originally from Kearney, Nebraska, and for the last 15 years, she's been in Lincoln. She's very inclusive about bringing neighbors in and, again, making changes as best as she can at the local level. And also, she loves talking about books, and that's how we got started. Um, and one of the entry points she talks about is having conversations with books like this with other people, learning to reflect upon it, as well as to think about what do you do after you read a book like this? And I participate in other book discussions, and that's one of the challenges uh, Sister Cynthia and I have talked about is after you read a book, what do you do with it? Do you become an activist? So Nebraska is a state that we have some challenges in recent years and more so, and we need to talk about how we make sure that the donor community and those of us who work in social justice can help push the envelope to bring more of the grassroots and grass tops into more some of the say uh, the, some of the activities that they're supposed to help their respective community. Um, so first of what I want to do is I want to start off, and as I said earlier, Lindsay, you may want to say just a little bit more about yourself. I didn't give much of an intro, and Aljamal doesn't need much of an introduction, not to be arrogant, but we do this a lot, but I'm a longtime community member, and we're going to stop there, as we say. Uh, but Lindsay, is there anything else you want to say about yourself before I start asking you your first question? Uh, no, just hello, everybody. Happy evening. Um, <laughs> it's good to be here, and um, I'd also just say I've been excited to have a book conversation uh, co-hosting with Ajamal. As he said, I've been a part of some of the book talks before, and I am an avid reader. I enjoy talking about what I'm reading with folks. And this was one that as I was reading it, I don't know, about a year and a half, two years ago to start, I was like, ooh, there's a lot to unpack here. And I need to be able to digest this with a group of people. So thanks for coming tonight. And um, also just want to say, like, I'm not an expert, um, just somebody who's really curious. I also know that this isn't the one and only book that talks about, you know, the donor community and philanthropy um, and decolonization just in general. Um, but this is just a book to kind of get us started and kind of thinking in that direction and just, yeah, chatting a little bit more about what we see locally. So first, I want to start off, and like I said, there's a number of questions we have, Lindsay, why don't you, how did you discover the book, and why did you suggest we include it within our more organization from your vantage point? Yeah, so um, I 
talk with some of my friends about uh, a lot of social justice issues pretty frequently. And this was one that a friend um, recommended to me. Uh, she had started reading it and we were both doing some grassroots work together and we're both feeling a little frustrated, to be honest, about not wanting to be a 501c3. We just wanted to be a group of you know, passionate folks who wanted to do some great stuff in our community, but we needed some funding to do some of those things. And we were just kind of coming up short. Um, so that was kind of one aspect. I've also worked in um, like a government sector. I've worked in nonprofits. I've worked in education and just consistently see a lot of inequities play out as it relates to funding and where funding's going, how funding's spent, who gets funding. I mean, all of those pieces and so when my friend Ruth, um, she wanted to be here tonight, but couldn't make it, um, when she uh, offered this book to me, I was like, okay, yeah, let's, let's read through it. Let's chat about it and see, you know, what this looks like. And I appreciate the decolonization lens as well. Um, I think we need to be more avid about naming that colonization is not a good thing um, and that it's really destroyed a lot of people and a lot of ways of life. And so looking at and naming that decolonizing is the way we need to go. That's also what struck me about this book just by the title. And so that's really what kind of got me into this. And yeah. then, yeah, how it relates back to more, I guess I didn't say that aspect. Um, this really covers a lot of uh, racial inequities um, within funding. Um, and yeah, I, I just know that more really focuses on a race equity lens as it relates to everything in our society. And funding really drives a lot of things, um, a lot of activities, a lot of opportunities. And so, yeah, I just thought, hey, Ajamal, should we talk about this? What do you think? And the rest is history. Yep, here we are. Yeah, do you want me to continue here, Ajamal? Right, right. We got a tag team, remember? Yeah, yeah. So um, I guess just throwing a question to you. Um, the author, Edgar Villanueva, um, as Ajamal said already, is a uh, Lumbee Native American from um, what we call now North Carolina, um, who grew up without much wealth and later came into wealth um, as he moved into some of the bigger donor circles and started to get some clout. And so essentially kind of coming from, as he says, not a lot, and then kind of rising into this different world. Um, Ajamal, what did you learn from some of his points? Because um, he talked a lot about how he just kind of got a, a look into the system and how it works. What did you kind of take away from that? Number one, it is rare to find someone who can write this well, who talks very vividly about the white savior complex, racism. And again, he's a wealthy individual because you don't see wealthy individuals or people from the donor community with a sense of consciousness of pushing back the way he did in his book. He also talks about the history of being a Native American and decolonization, uh, how you got to break that, how humaniza you know, dehumanization that goes on. He's very much in this book. And again, on page four of the introduction, he has all these arguments and these points about disadvantage, marginalized people, and all the euphemism we use. And the OPS is known for saying, re free and reduced lunch and all that crap. Like people don't learn or they lack cognitive process because they're low income. He pushes back at that in his book. He also talks about 85% of the people who are in the CEOs and so are white and foundation boards. And we have the same problem in Omaha and Nebraska. I like that about the book for those who haven't read it. And then more than anything, I think the fact that he brings his race in it. He also talks about South Africa. So he looks at using terms like apartheid, which I use a lot to describe Omaha and the stuff. And some people cringe when you say that. But how do you divide a city that's, how do you talk about a city that's been historically divided such as ours? And again, it's that blunt, honest conversation that he brought to the book that was a fresh breath of fresh air for me. And more than anything, if you go through the first few chapters, he used analogies related to slavery. And so that's one of the things I wanted to throw out that I think was very good that made it uh, powerful for me to kind of say, let's keep reading this book. And I was kind of excited uh, that, again, you have somebody who comes from that worldview because you don't see that locally. And I've never met too many people who work in that world, even as, uh, uh, as they call my friend Jack, who's the managerial class, work as, as uh, agents for them, even push back using that kind of language. So the book was refreshing. It was excellent. And again, that's when I encourage people to read it because it it, it really it, it, it deconstructs and it, it forces us in a sense to say, the kind of stuff we've been doing for years has not worked because we have spent millions of dollars and it just hasn't changed. So I was really excited about the way he laid that out. But that was really good for me. Yeah. And I guess to kind of continue on that thread too, 
Um, cause you did talk about, as you said, um, just all of the barriers and challenges that, uh, people of color specifically face as it relates to philanthropy and gaining funding, getting funded, or even having positions within the funding world. I mean, if you haven't read the book, the data in there is wild um, and it's recent. Um, yeah, well, hold, think, on, hold on, just quick second. When you use yeah. the word wow, what does it mean in that we say it's wild or at least you said recent, I said that, but we say it's wild, what does that mean? Wild, uh, I'm trying to stay away from like words like crazy and nuts, but it's just, it blows my mind. Okay. I got you. The, Thank you. The data. Yeah. Got you. Yep. So I'll use that instead. It blows my mind. Um, <laughs> but also, also not really. I mean, we know that our, like, I, I'm also not surprised either, I guess. I just seeing the data and the numbers just, yeah, blew my mind, um, as to how white it is in the philanthropy world. And then also how many organizations that are white led, are the ones getting the funding. And so my question for you is locally here in Omaha, Lincoln, Nebraska, um, what barriers have you seen um, that make it difficult for communities of color to benefit from philanthropy and other resources? And what have you observed just within your work, whether in more or other aspects of your work? Yeah, and, and you know, one of the things we did agree to do today, we are a grassroots organization, we have to call names out. But again, I'm not going to call out Omaha Community Foundation, but they just got through recently appointing three white board members. And again, they have a, a minority fund and some other stuff. And what we're saying is that my experience is that if you're going to have people of color or low income people, whoever, women, you whatever group you're looking at being inclusive they should be on your board and they should be of equal representation to have an impact and so one of the things is board of directors how many people of color or low-income people are people from that community are there and i'm not going to mention uh open sky or any of these organizations but they will start an advice group why do you need advisory group when some of those advisory members who are qualified should be on your board and so this book talks about that the other thing is writing um i think when you write those grants or you have those applications, make sure they're deconstructed and easy for people to understand and read. And if they're not, try to make them simple enough that you can work with groups. And what we've discovered is more is that oftentimes they'll make you write a long-winded grant when in actual fact they're going to get to the friends of the system anyway. And so that's been one of our, our observations as an organization. And one point we even applied for, I'm not going to mention the name of the Crime Commission, the Nebraska uh, Crime Commission, and Karen could be, allude to this, but we heard from Rich that we didn't get a, the money because we criticized another nonprofit. Again, we had a, a good grant. It was written well and all that. But again, someone we should were, not be allowed. We were to, given the grant, Ajamal. We, we were, were given, given the grant, and it was retracted from us because we criticized Operation Youth Success, which is no longer existing. Because again, it was one of those kind of white savior programs that had no real substantive value of changing the juvenile justice system. So, you know, again, one county commissioner made that decision. Only we know that because someone who's no longer working, Douglas County, told us the story. Uh, and the crime commission, again, that's part of our, our concern. That was one issue. And then the other issue, I think, more that, that I got from, uh, you know, on the barriers, and, and I think Liz is an excellent question, is that if we're serious about changes, what are the empirical outcomes or the data or what does it reflect? Our experience is more is that there's very few organizations that can produce data or track record of outcomes, outputs, and even some kind of uh some kind of verifiable evidence base that they've made the changes. Again, right now you look at some of the grants, we want to address gang violence and violence. And yeah, hold it, how are you going to address that when the people work behind plexiglass doors and they've never been in the North or South Omaha? And I know when I worked at Douglas County, a lot of my colleagues had never traveled to North and South Omaha per se, except through the interstate. So to answer that in the nutshell without getting long-winded is that we're going to not have communities benefit from some of this, what this book is about. And let's look at the gatekeepers and the elites that come out in the community and acknowledge that there's white privilege and the money for the most part doesn't have a track record of making Get outcomes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my question back to you, and let me throw this back out. Audrey Lord, the famous uh, African American lesbian, I like to talk about her because she's a brilliant writer, and she has something that says one of her most famous quote is, "The master's tool will never dismantle the master's house. Uh, you must, you cannot use someone else's fire. You can only use your own. To do that, you must be willing to believe in it." How do you translate, and Lindsay, this is also not only just for you, but those of us who are participating, how do you translate reading these things in this book into change from institutions or within or outside? Because I know you've worked in nonprofits and you worked in different capacities, but how do you do that as a worker bee who's inside of an octopus? That's kind of a unusual way of putting it. No, I, I hear what you're laying down, though. Um, and I've got, I hope I don't get too off on this, but 
mad respect for Audrey Lord. Um, and I really agree with her. I don't think you can change uh, the institutions from within because the institutions were set up to fail to begin with, like fail, fail the people that are most historically marginalized. And um, so I think it's really, I've tried <laughs> um, and I know I'm just one person, but I know a lot of folks who go into, again, government work, education, nonprofits that really do want to make changes they want to see in the world and they're passionate about the work they do. They're um, impacted by the things that they're fighting for, like all of these different things. And so it's not just me, but I've definitely seen other folks that I've worked with um, who just get beaten down by trying to make the changes they do want to see. And I mean, it's simple stuff too. It's, it's not like these big ideas. I see. Yeah. said you're raising your hand. So maybe I'm not alone here. Um, but I think it's just really hard to change the systems when they are set up to be really confusing. Um, they're not meant to be very accessible. They're not actually, um, fully thinking about what people need. Um, they're really trying to keep people pushed down, keep us kind of on the conveyor belt, um, opposed to actually raising people up and, and educating folks or giving folks what they actually need to, to survive in this world. And so I don't mean to be so pessimistic, um, because I think there are things that we can do collectively, uh, to start to make the changes we want to see, but I'm not sure if it necessarily happens fully within the institutions. I feel like it happens within community and, um, he, Villanueva talks a lot about medicine, um, especially in the second part of the book. And we'll talk more about medicine a little bit later, but essentially medicine being what can you offer, like, what are your skills? What are your assets? What are your strengths that you want to contribute to seeing, you know, things change? Um, and medicine looks different for all of us, right? But I do think and truly believe that if we are using our medicine and we're practicing our medicine, it's not going to be perfect. Always. We're going to make mistakes and, you know, all of that. But I think if we are truly here to, to build community and be together in community, I think that can, if we're modeling it together and if we're actually practicing it, I feel like that can start to make the ripples of change that we want to see. But in terms of doing things from within the system, um, I think it's really hard. Um, and I don't know if it's, it's truly possible, but um, that's, that's my view on that. You know, just let me add real quickly. I, I understand what you just said, but I also think that could happen if you have inside persons like Deep Throat, meaning they can share information with somebody externally. Because again, when I worked at Catholic Charities, I worked for a promise ship or other organization, there are things I had to do eight to five and I had no control over that because it was part of me keeping my job. But at the same time, with the credible messengers that I work with, I can sometimes share things with them where my hands was tied and I would pass that warm baton over to them in a hopefully respectful way that, number one, they wouldn't blow my cover because I was a secret agent man at times. But I think you could bring both worlds together. And again, organizations worth of salt should have advisory groups or have some kind of representative of that group to help make sure that they don't run the ship up on the iceberg or something like that. And I think that's one reason I would say there are some people inside who can do very good. But again, I would tell people my long history of working with Amal Public Schools, I may have met one or two persons who's a credible messenger that I can work with. Again, I, I don't like to name drop all the time. But again, systems become what they are because they don't know how to do what you just described, Lindsay. Yeah, and and I totally hear what you're saying too. And I also think that um, people get beat down after years of really trying to do those changes. I was just talking to my dad last night, actually, about this. He was an athletic trainer at Kearney High for 25, 30 years. And he talked about all the things that he was trying to do to do better by the athletes, make sure, because he also taught classes too, um, and what the education world was like for him. And even though he like his purpose was to, you know, make sure the athletes were healthy, make sure they were able to compete, make sure that they were also getting their education, all of the different things that come in to making the work harder, like unnecessary documentation or all of these excess meetings that he didn't really need to go to that he could have been spending on working with students. And that's just like one example of just after a while, he was like, I just wanted to just do my job and like do what I needed to do in order to get through the day. Um, he still did best by his students, but I, what I'm getting at here is there's just so many different things that come into play that after a while, people are just like, either I'm done, I can't do this anymore, or 
they just start to go through the motions because that's how they can get through the day. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I think like, if we're really trying to change the systems from within, we need a community in order to do that. Because if it's just one or two of us, we're going to pe yeah, people are, people are tired. We have about 10 minutes left or so for us to communicate still, and then we're going to move on to the audience. So hold your horses, folks. We're going to get to it. Our next one here, Lindsay, is? Yeah. So um, talking about just diversity efforts and such, he talks a lot about this in chapter three, and I got this specifically from page 47 for those of you following along at home. Um, but he, he talks a lot about how, you know, so many folks are like, okay, well, if we're going to combat this you know, white supremacist, philanthropist sort of world, we need diversity. And so there's all these diversity efforts that are going into play, but as Villanueva describes, diversity efforts tend to turn into tokenism or we're bringing in folks of color, folks from different backgrounds, but we're not actually gonna let them use their voices or we're not gonna listen to them. Um, I'm just curious where you've seen diversity efforts backfire from your lens in the Omaha, Nebraska communities. And if you have any ideas or solutions to kind of counter that. You know, I really appreciate your honesty and also how we can name names. And you know, I know Keith Station is the diversity experts and now I heard he's the chief of staff, but he's in a position working for the city and I've written three letters he's never written back. And so you got people who've never studied about race. They have no track record of it. And DEI is a strange term to me. I don't even like the term because it gets away from racism. And we say diversity, inclusion and equity. So what, what does that mean? Uh, and it becoming euphemism. I've seen people who have the intelligence of an amoeba go to some training. Now they're experts on diversity. And again, as you alluded to earlier, you got people who are not qualified. You got, uh, for example, when I was uh, teaching courses in Black Studies, I met a woman who was teaching multicultural counseling, and she got her job because she had adopted a Black baby. She was a white woman, and she had a master's degree in counseling. She told me she got the job that way. She confessed to me. She invited me to come and speak at her class once. She never invited me back again because I kind of alluded to how she got her job. Uh, the university, you know, you know, was not serious. Uh, you got the so-called diversity classes out there in education. Look at the results. And so part of what we've done is we've taken diversity and race issues and lumped them all in under this inclusive stuff and this uh, intersectionality. And we never deal with the elephant on the table. And so that's number one. Number two, uh, I'm not going to mention John Pierce's name because he used to work at Creighton. He's a nice black guy. But one day I asked him for the diversity numbers at Creighton. He says, I don't have to give it to you because we're a private institution. I don't know how true that was, but if you look at their letterhead, they all had Equal Opportunity Commission, or Equal Opportunity Opportunities, but if you look at the numbers, it's, it speaks to different no, no, uh, uh, notion. And so that's another thing. The other thing I think is probably the most important one is that we have to have accreditation of what's really, what do we mean by that? You know, we can say you live in different parts of town, that's diversity. You are a different gender, that's diversity. Again, it has no substance if we're not addressing the essence of the historical stuff that has kept people locked out in our clan effects that mentality. Again, they've brought these some called handkerchief head Negroes up here from the South who grew up in Mississippi and elsewhere, and now they make them leaders. Again, I'm not going to call their names out, but at the end of the day, our community looks like it did 10 and 20 years ago in terms of numbers. And I'm not saying you got to have a UNICEF postcard look, Lindsay, or anything like that, but look at the results. The economic divide is becoming greater, especially since COVID-19. And so this is why I think sometimes these things that backfire, and you hear some of these racist and white supremacists says we want to have qualified minorities. Well, they figure out how the qualified ones are the one who keep their mouths shut and who have nothing to say. Again, there are people I grew up with in this community. I've never seen their name on one sheet of paper talking about public policy, social justice. I don't even know if they're literate, they know how to write. Again, my point I'm trying to say is that if we're serious about some of these issues, we're going to leave breadcrumbs for the next generation and we haven't done it. Look at your Black Studies Department, look at Latino Studies, Native American. I see we have uh, Dr. Patrick Vell last question in the house. He just finished a wonderful, brilliant paper that when you read it, you got to put on sunglasses, you might get retina damage. But we sent that to 30 faculty members of color at the university. Only one of them responded to that. Again, we can talk about that. But again, how do you write a paper or a report about their lack of inclusion and diversity, and particularly to those who got their jobs through uh, us pushing for affirmative action, having dark skin faces in high places, and the very people who benefit some of these handkerchief heads and teal tacos have tenure? 
You want to hear a peep out of them. I mean, there's something the governor just said recently about a Chinese American or Chinese visitor about she's a communist because she exposes pig farm. Where are the people who should be speaking out as Martin Luther King talks about in the 1960s? So my point is some of this DEI stuff has backfired because we've allowed these folks to get away with stuff. And sister alluded to this, if you study history of what happened in Nazi Germany and even in the deep South, there are a lot of people standing on the sidelines and we cannot be those kind of people uh, when history we paint us differently. So I think DEI can be a subterfuge for dealing with the real work because, again, uh, sideline people and people who looked at stuff happen and didn't do anything illustrates our, our lack of, of connectedness to the past as well as to the future. Mm-hmm. We're down to it. And I'm going to ask, uh, what, uh, yeah, I think there's a question that jumps out here is that how do we, I think you you raised this question in some way. What was the next question you raised, Lindsay? Um, well, it, it kind of continues into what you were already talking about, but Villanueva also talked a lot about tokenism mm-hmm. and how tokenism shows up heavily in philanthropy and he shares his own stories of it. He talks to a lot of other, um, BIPOC, uh, philanthropists and, um, folks who are part of the funding community about their experiences also feeling tokenized. And so I was just curious if you had anything else to say on just how tokenism shows up and how you've seen it show up. Um, and if you have any thoughts on um, combating tokenism. Yeah, and and, and, I, and I don't like to mention Patrick Jones. He's a white professor in Lincoln, but years ago we were talking and I asked him as a white professor teaching Black studies or ethnic studies, who, when do you invite people of color to your class? It's like me teaching a class on women's issue and I never invite women. I'm honored to be able to do that or teach a class on uh, religion and I'm a bona fide atheist. I should at least bring other people in to help me teach that class. And his comment was, I'm a gatekeeper, I bring in gatekeeper, I bring in who I want. Well, you often you've told me what you're about, then you'll filter an agent and you're not gonna allow those very people who you teach about to even have the sacredness of being in that classroom to help students learn what the real McCoy is. We have these fake people. So part of what I'm saying is when I took the multicultural class. Or taught it at Metro. I also took it from Bobby Davis, who was an expert. She's late now, but she was a great teacher, had a degree in psychology. So again, I went through this baptismal uh, process of learning from at the feet of people who were well respected in our community. And so right now you go off and and I think that's part of that tokenism you're talking about. As I say, in the education department, a lot of those students will take classes from Becky's and, and white women who live in Bellevue or in Papillion La Vista, and they have no clue of dealing with African American men or black families. And even when I was teaching social, it's not going to be about me, but in order to teach about black families, you should at least have one or be around one. And when they asked me not to teach it because I didn't have a degree in social work, even though I had expertise, they hired a person who would not have what we call extended uh, family and so on. So part of the tokenism is we got to make sure that people are prepared to eat the food that they cook. And we have problems with that in Nebraska more so uh, and so on. I'm going to stop right there. So I'm going to ask you a question here is, Lindsay, and I go we're getting close to the end is, how can we change organizations and how can we deal with some of this? I'm throwing that out at you. How can we uh, make our help? And again, it's a group question. And by the way, there are a number of questions that Lindsay put together and we threw in the group chat. But I want to ask her that question before we got into uh, switching to the total group conversation. Yeah, and I'll, I know some of you joined maybe after I had put those in the chat. So I just put in some more questions that you can think about or if you have other thoughts before we get into the group conversation. Um, These are just to get us thinking about stuff a little bit. Um, But Ajamal, to go back to your question, I think there's um, a lot of ways that we can work towards decolonization as, you know, organizations, as people, as philanthropists, like wherever sectors we're professionally maybe a part of, or even just voluntarily a part of. um, I think that you mentioned it earlier, um, making sure our boards are definitely um, representing the the values and the mission of the organization or of the the group. Um, If you do have just the same demographic all sitting on your board, that's really not going to push for any changes. It's not going to be representative of the community. um, And there's going to be a lot lost there. Um, And so just boards making sure that they're, um, again, made up of the uh, the folks who are impacted also just by the work that, that folks are doing. Um, I think uh, funders specifically need to actually know who they're funding um, and make sure that there's accountability there and transparency. I've been a part of so many meetings where funding meetings um, around grants and such, where there's a lot of folks in the room that are talking about all the great things that are happening with this grant and not really talking about any of the challenges just so they can still get funding. 
And so I think we need to have a culture in this world of just openness and um, being able to have tough conversations because there are a zillion reasons why things might not go as planned and that should be okay, not something to be penalized by. Um, and that's also why I feel like there's a lot of uh, organizations that continue to get funded when I feel they might, they shouldn't be um, because the people on the ground will see that the organization isn't actually doing the work that they say they do, but because the funders aren't on the ground, they're not seeing that. And they're just hearing what the director or whoever is in charge of that grant is saying about it. So there's a huge disconnect. And so going back to that, I think the funders just really need to know what the work is that they're funding. And again, you mentioned this earlier, but that means like being a part of the communities that they're funding um, and being a part of the events or the activities, conversations, et cetera. So they actually know what's going on. Um, I also uh, think that we need to quit stereotyping folks um, and make sure that we're actually looking in the mirror ourselves too. And so for example, um, just how we fund and what we fund and so a lot of the funding goes towards programs and supplies and mm, that's literature books and which those are all great, but they don't really go to fund people. Um, and so either people doing the work um, or people that are helping do the work that maybe need some extra compensation um, to be able to help do some of those pieces like advisory groups of impacted folks should be compensated for their time in a lot of ways. Um, funding also doesn't typically cover food. Um, and food is also, as we know, like the number one thing that brings people together <laughs> is sharing food. And so why are these things not being funded? And the thing that I was mentioning about stereotype, like I, I hope people stop stereotyping their clients or the people that they're serving. Um, I've been in conversations where we're trying to fund a position that can help bring people together. Um, and we want to fund somebody who's a part of the community, yet the salary is only like 35 to 45,000. And when there's pushback on that of like, no, that's not a livable wage. We need to be offering more to these folks who are doing this work. It's like, oh no, that's fine. What's that is a livable wage. And it's like, this is also coming from somebody who's making six figures who hasn't lived on a $35,000 a year salary. Like there's, so there's just this huge disconnect. And then a lot of assumptions that are made. Um, so I don't know, I'm kind of blabbering now, but I think that there's a lot of different things that folks could do um, to just make sure that we're really moving towards decolonizing how we give wealth opposed to keeping a colonized, a colonized and really white supremacist mindset. Well, good. I tell you, that gives us a chance to make the transition as a timekeeper. I'm not in the matrix, but uh, th th that's the key person there. Okay. Uh, we're at our 30 minutes. Uh, two quick points I want to say, folks. One of the things that I drop names all the time, because I can do that, and I don't have to worry about somebody looking over my shoulders. But secondly, sometime in Nebraska and in, in, in our communities and elsewhere, we have this niceness where we're telling the truth, and yet we're afraid to name names. And so at the end of the day, people don't grow from their mistakes because we let them get away with stuff. And so again, take me to court, sue me if I'm lying. But again, these are things that you, I couldn't make up. So one of the things I encourage folks, if there's a situation, particularly from an institution, or you're talking about a government person, you can be, uh, you have a sense of uh, uh, immunity from government officials, you can call them eggheads or whatever, we don't like doing that. But some of the stuff that they say and do, they got to be called to the carpet. So I'm going to stop there. And I'm going to throw it out. And I see a hand is up from Sid. So uh, Mrs. Kelly, you want to say something? And I also know we got some other heavy hitters in, in this session. So we got an hour, or at least uh, close to it to let y'all throw awesome heavy life and uh lindsay and i are going to step back and become the moderators of true sense so go for it okay well i was just on the first part of your conversation talking about trying to change organizations from within and how you get beaten down uh you know it's like banging your head against a wall trying to get anybody to do more than nod and say what a great idea let's do lunch and you never hear from them again um but it's it's more than just a futile effort for one person. The system is designed specifically to keep you down. If you are one who wants to talk about um, raising salaries of the lowest paid or, you know, why does this group get this and this group doesn't? 
those kinds of things, then you are not on any kind of a fast track to get to the top. In fact, there's somebody already documenting every little mistake you make. So they have, you know, a path to get rid of you. So to change from within, um, it has to start from the top down. And the people who want to make the changes can't get to the top because the people at the top don't want to be toppled. <laughs> it's designed that way. And it's, Somebody may not be thinking it directly, but their behaviors and the rules, they just don't look at them very closely because they really do know what it's about and they don't want to face that. They just want to, oh no, we can't change things. You know, things are fine the way they are. You're a whiner, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, it's all meant to keep change from happening, to protect the status quo. Right. Appreciate it. Other feedback. Other, I said, Karen, you got your hand out. Karen, go on, you got to get off of mute. There you Sorry, go. Sorry, I was just applauding. Oh. <laughs> but, but I do, I agree with, with what Sid's saying. I think that the issue is that every single organization in, you know, whether it's a nonprofit or a corporate entity or, um, or a philanthropy, we're all, all the organizations and the people in them are swimming in these colonialist white supremacist waters. So um, the structure of nonprofits, the, the way that the board is over the executive director, it's like a beast with many heads to begin with, and you're beholden to the board uh, if you're in a nonprofit, and then also to your funders, so you've got even more heads um and and philanth most of the philanthropies are themselves nonprofits they also have boards um is, and you know when you're talking about the the hierarchical oppressive structure of the organizations to begin with um that's so the it's very challenging i agree with sid on this to change things from the inside unless you're willing to do the hard work and your board is willing to do the hard work of of creating a different kind of structure and i think that's what villanueva ended up doing is developing his own philanthropic organization leaving the white led ones and starting one that was led or is being led by black people, indigenous people and other people of color, um, you know, with that, with that idea in mind that, you know, the only way to make change happen is to do it himself. You know, uh, I, I have a quick question. I'm going to go back to Sid and maybe Karen, you can also allude to this or she, Sid, when she, she was talking, she says change has to come from the top up. But yet we know changes have not come from the top up. So what's the subterfuge or what's the argument or what can we do if we know that systems are not going to change? How do we change this? And again, we're facing that here in Omaha. And Karen, I'm going to go by the time when we had an interview with the foundation. They said you were next in line. We didn't have enough money to give you because we gave it to our pet peeves. Uh, but we was, they were almost indirectly promised that stay asking for money. We'll give you money next year. Uh, we were very upset about that because we thought we had a pretty good grant. Plus, we thought we had better social capital community. But my question said, I guess, if if change is only going to come from the top and top won't want to do it, going back to what Lindsay says, are you saying it's hopeless that we won't get this change that we want because the top is uh, myopic or they are somewhat, uh, they're blind on this whole issue of social justice, what this book speaks about? Um, I don't think anybody's blind. I think they like to wear designer blinders um, <laughs> and when i i don't mean to sound like it's impossible or a lost cause or anything like that i'm just saying it's no wonder people get burnt out and leave a position before they've been able to accomplish anything because they have been labeled as troublemakers and therefore they can't advance professionally in their career to get a little more power to be able to make okay. changes. Got you. I understand. Um, Thank you. I think that it needs to come from the outside as well. And okay. it may be public pressure to, you know, have boards that actually reflect the community. Gotcha. No, I understand now. Thank you. 
Karen, did you want to say something? No, we can move on to some other voices. Okay, other voices at the table. Yeah, Jamal, I just wanted to ask if you guys are familiar with some of the large foundations like the Omaha Community Foundation and whether they're aware of any of these kinds of writings and about how they could be uh, moving towards making their boards um, much more, I mean, like pushing 60% more representative of the populations that they're serving here. I don't know much about those boards, especially like Omaha Community Foundation seems to be the big one, but maybe somebody on here has dealt with them before, knows how they deal with those. And are they aware of this kind of writing and, and uh, this kind of thinking from people that have had this lived experience like the author on this book? Karen, can you answer that one? Is that, how do you have expertise? Because you know some of these people better than I do. So, uh, yeah, and Lindsay, feel free to pipe in because you sound like you're pretty familiar from the uh, Lincoln point of view. Um, so I think that that there are individuals within some of these organizations and sometimes there's even leadership. And I think that uh, there, there also tend to be big bureaucracies. Um, and as we all know, bureaucracies move slowly. These large philanthropic organizations uh, that have been around for years, um, they're, they're hard to, you know, they're hard to change. And, um, and then there are also some uh, family foundations that are well known in the area. And uh, there, that's a different model altogether because a family foundation is literally led by a family and the people in the family get to pick and choose how they're going to do things. Um, and so uh, trying to, to make change happen, uh, you know, in a, in a family, you know, you know what your own families are like. So you can imagine uh, what it's like when you've got a very wealthy family, when it, you have different members of the family or, you know, there's infighting and da, 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 da. I think it's challenging. Um, so I think that some organizations have some individuals who are interested and, uh, and I haven't seen much in the way of substantial change um, happening in the Omaha philanthropic community. Um, what's what's happening in Lincoln? Uh, about the same from what I've seen. Um, Paul, I think that's a great question. And that's partly why I, I personally wanted to talk about this a little bit more because I'm curious how, whether it's this book, other readings, I mean, just to get a conversation started with folks in the philanthropy world, because from what I'd seen, um, it was mostly, and I had been more in the work in the world of philanthropy, not myself, but just as somebody who receives grants, um, about three years, two, three years ago. And, um, I just feel like a lot of them talk, but don't walk, or they'll say like, we're doing this book club and we're going to be talking about this reading, but then nothing comes out of it. Um, and so I said, I like what you said about like the designer blinders or the designer glasses, um, because I like that spoke to me too. I think that people aren't fully blind. I think they just don't want to do the tough work to really move things forward is maybe one thing. I think some people don't believe it. Um, you know, there's a lot of pushback <laughs> around, um, white supremacy and, especially white people naming that white supremacy is a thing and colonization is a thing. And so again, I'm kind of going off on a different tangent here, but um, long answer short, no, I don't think there's a lot of uh, the real work going on in Lincoln from what I've seen, at least. Yeah. Jack, Jack has his hand up. Jack? Jack, we can't hear you. You're on mute or something or some reason. I don't even see a mute button there. Yeah, it doesn't look like you're muted, Jack, but we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Paul, I was going to, like Jack is working on it. Paul, I ask you to push back at you a little bit. In the work that you've done. His headphones, and, Jack. Is Jack back on now? It might be his headphones. Can okay. Be... Jack, Paul, just quickly, in the work that you've done, has somebody ever approached you and said they want to fund the work that you've done as you've done as an individual in the state, whether it be with your work with the correction? Uh, the poverty issue, all that. Have anyone approached you and made donations, asked you how they contribute to that cause or anything like that? 
in the work, and I know you've been doing this for a number of years, but Paul, if anybody ever came up to you and say, we want to flatten the pyramid, we want to support your work, have they handed you a check or anything on any of the money that you've done as an individual? Well, you know, I, I was just thinking, you know, we were talking about boards and stuff. Um, I had a, uh, I spent a quite a bit of time down at City Hall trying to raise attention to child poverty. And we actually put a panel discussion together and had pretty good participation well, we had attendance from city city uh, council and state legislators and county commissioners. And um, I really wanted them to hear the voices of people that had experienced poverty. And I picked, oh, I, I talked four people that I got to build relationships with that had extensive life histories in poverty. One guy had been incarcerated and worked his way out. Um, another woman had built a really great company after going through all kinds of mental health and poverty issues. Another one was in tears talking about raising her child in poverty. And um, well, Paul, what, I was, what, what I was asking specifically, has anybody ever donated money to any cause that you worked on in City Hall or all the work you've done? Has somebody walked up from the donor community and say, Paul, I like the work you're doing. We want to help fund that. Is there anybody who's done that that you're aware of in, in our community or in our state? No, no. I, and that's not really what I'm not a. I'm not somebody that's from the community looking to make those changes. I'm looking to empower people in the community, and you know that panel of four people. I'm I'm trying to figure. out, ask people here in the, on the audience, why couldn't those four very bright, successful people who had pulled themselves out of poverty be put on a board or put in a position of power? I think that's what I got out of the book. Is you need a panel of people like that running the decision making in terms of how resources can be used as medicine and that's gotcha. and I, i'm not seeing and i don't know if that doesn't happen but i i would have loved to have, have those four people on a commission on how to solve poverty and uh, you know or what to do with an organization that's got resources and i'm just i kind of got that out of the book that's why i was kind of excited about listening to the book and and um i don't know if other people are aware of that, how that's played out in other organizations, whether you have people that have experienced that kind of poverty or racism that are really in positions of power in, in organizations in group, by the group, not just like a one representative, but actually large groups of them. Yeah, Paul, um, just speaking from my own experience, I'm, I'm on a board here in Lincoln, I'm on the NeighborWorks board, and I was somebody who got my house through going through the program at NeighborWorks. Um, and like a third of a board, a third of our board has to be representative of the community. And <laughs> what we found to be challenging too was um, the typical board schedule and structure, and that was not very isn't accessible. Um, we have a lot of folks who maybe work a couple jobs, have kids. Um, our board meeting is around dinner time. And um, when we went through like our board culture survey with the NeighborWorks America, they told us that one the big thing that we were deemed on was engagement from the board and board members not showing up to these meetings on a consistent basis. And a lot of us had some pretty great pushback on that of like, well, there are other ways to be engaged besides coming to a meeting. People are showing up in a lot of other ways. So I guess what I'm saying is I, I think that's a part of the white supremacy culture too, is the way that boards function. And if we could get away from like the traditional way of functioning as a board and leave room for other engagements while still being on a board and still being able to make decisions, because I know the meetings are where the decisions happen, right? There's, there's like that aspect that's real. And are there other ways that people can be engaged that also help fit their schedule? Because we know that people coming from different backgrounds have different schedules and they can't fit into this cookie cutter way of doing things. And well, so- it reminds me today of when um, I talked to the guy at OPS about truancy. He was on the school board and he said they're working on ways to try and get kids to show up. And I talked to somebody a while back that said, maybe we should pay them. Um, and I thought, you know, that might work. And board members, yeah, okay, you got a board members of people that have experienced poverty. Let's have them work for free. That sounds like a pretty smart approach to things. Um, and so I can see where like that group that I had, they actually are pretty successful financially now. But if you have people that are actually experiencing poverty, providing resources to them as part of the organizational structure 
paying them to be a part of it seems like it would be a way to do what he's talking about in this book. But um, that just got my brain thinking about those things. So, well, you know, the, it speaks also to NCAP or it used to be former GOCA, Great Army Community Action, where they were a CAP agency and they had to have like a high percentage of their board members to be either low income or from the community of certain sorts. I know Charles Drew at one point as one of those uh, community health centers, they had to have a certain amount of people who were users of their services, which being some of them had to qualify uh, to be low income. And then of course, legal aid back in the day used to have a lot of uh, requirements as they got their funding to have consumers or people on their board who have utilized their services. A lot of these nonprofits have gotten away from flattening the pyramid. So you don't see a lot of that. And this is why when I hear, listen to John uh, John uh, over at uh, Heartland Family say that in order to be on their board, you got to raise two or $3,000 just to be a board member. Well, who can raise that kind of money who's grassroots and who work eight to five or who's not working at all? And so you got this elitism that goes on in our community. So Paul, your point is well taken. If we could start to restructure some of these elite boards and make sure they're not apartheid boards. And also when I use the word apartheid, I'm also talking about economically, uh, somewhat ge geographically, where again, you got these uh, people who come in and fly in and they don't have no uh, allegiance. I know back in the day, uh, when I was at, a, at my non, one of the nonprofits, they would have different board meetings rotate at the different sites in different parts of the community. Uh, we don't see a lot of that. You know, some boards, I'm like I mentioned, an organization that serves certain people of color, they won't even meet in their building. They'll meet elsewhere away from the community. Well, what does that say? Habitat for Humanity, again, Lindsay, going back to your point, in order to get into some of those programs, you have to give sweat equity. How do you take some of those sweat equity people and put them on your board of directors? Because right now, Habitat doesn't have uh, grassroots on their board, at least when I can see looking at the names and so on. But those are the kind of questions I think the book speaks to. And I think that might be what the pushback to help us make this a realization here in, in Nebraska. Let me stop there. Oh, other stop. feedback, other reactions. Sorry, I won't, I won't talk too much because I've already talked a lot just on this board conversation too. something else that I've been, has been swirling in my mind is how many of the same people are on so many boards <laughs> and how that also just shuts down a lot um, in a lot of ways, because if there is conflict, let's say, or there's a need to be transparent, or maybe one, an employee from this org wants to apply for a job at this org but their boss is on the board of this org. Like there's just all sorts of challenges there too. So I personally would like to see some sort of like a cap, <laughs> maybe how many boards you can be on at a time. I, I don't know if we need to, you know, do that, but that's also just something that I've noticed. Sorry, Sid. It's okay. Yes. Uh, Sid, I see your hands up. I wonder, I was thinking about the pressure from the outside to force boards to do more. And um, this whole thing about having grassroots people on the board, and of course they don't get to jump into their Mercedes and you know have the housekeeper leave dinner for the kids um, to go to meetings. Um, and I know that people who work in nonprofits know how to get people to come to meetings. You serve dinner, you provide childcare, you know, boards just have to do that. And I think, I wonder if we couldn't mount some sort of campaign to pressure boards publicly to put up or shut up, you know, DEI, show me, you know, and what are you doing to make that happen? Well, we put somebody on the board, but they never came to the meetings. Did you ever ask them why? You know what I mean? I mean, publicly, billboards, you know, talk on public radio, whatever. I wonder if we could do that. I appreciate it. Good, good feedback. Good feedback. You know, going, switching back a little bit to the book, one of the things that I found uh, thought provoking is that he did lay out some empirical facts or data that you can do to show that you are there. And one of the things going back to some of the stuff that Karen and I worked on is a matrix. In other words, we sometimes think we're doing this, but if you really do a, an audit, Many of these organizations don't have that. And then secondly, 
Uh, have you ever done a climate audit? In other words, what is the environment like? Is it toxic? Is it, you know, inclusive? Do you feel welcome when you come there? And again, Sid, going to your point, you may bring one person on and they'll stay for one or two meetings. But if you're talking gibbly gook or speaking some kind of language that they don't understand, and one of my experiences when I served six years on the Chicano Awareness Center Board or Latino Center of the Midlands Board, uh, I was the only African American for many years on that board. And it came because United Way was pushing uh, organizations of color to have more whites and different people on their boards, but they wouldn't do the same for the Jewish community board that they were funding under some of their own organizations. So until we hold the same barometer or litmus test for all of our boards, and particularly in a city such as Omaha, which is 33 to 35% people of color, we're going to get what this book talks about, this uh, great white savior stuff. And again, what Paul alluded to earlier, not bringing the people out of a long-term poverty and to be able to be self-sufficient do for themselves. So yeah, the book speaks to that to me also. And I wish there was a way we can get people in the donor community to read it. Other feedback. By the way, folks, we don't have to go to the full eight o'clock, but I just wanted to give people a chance who had not said anything, if anything else they wanted to say uh, or for the record, because we will... Uh, this has been recorded. We'll put it on our on our web page and also have an evaluation on how we can continue these conversations. And particularly, Lindsay, we really appreciate you bringing this book forward to getting us into this discussion because this is probably one of the first times we've had a book like this where we talk to the donor community or to the wealthy folks who fund a lot of these uh, organizations that don't have effectiveness. Is there anybody that's ever seen a plan with a company or an organization where they actually have a pretty lucrative compensation plan for board members so they can actually bring people from with lived experience uh wow. into the is that ever uh, is that just i've never dealt with boards before uh, no one's ever asked me to be on a board well ajamal kind of alluded to it one time but that's okay it, but it's it's not my bag and but i'm thinking with people with lived experience in a group that's working on the problem that they're experiencing paying them and compensating them significantly to show up on a regular basis would be very valuable. Um, but is that crazy talk or has that ever been? You know, I don't, I don't think it is. The Mecca board pays their members, but that's elite board. Uh, what's the other organization? Um, uh, MAPA, not MAPA, but Mayor Air, Area Transit, they pay their board members. But again, the mayor gets to appoint her person who she likes and they get like back in the day, they got $500 a meeting. Uh, but Paul, that's a great point. If somebody is having some economic challenges and they got to be away from their family, at least give them, you know, a, a buck, not a buck, but give them some gas money, give them enough, you know, what you would pay an hour of salaries of professional. And now that's one of the issues that Karen was critical of. We was working with these white women from Lincoln where they were all had jobs and they expect us to come and volunteer uh, to help them organize themselves, but yet they didn't want to provide any of their discretionary funding for the work that we've done for seven months to help them come around and talk about the very things we're talking about here today. So our concern is if you're serious about diversity, race, class, geography, all these other issues, gender, sometimes those groups are not there. Let's figure out ways to reward them. And it doesn't be a lot of money, but just something, Paul, that like you said, it, it could go a long ways to help somebody who's a credible messenger versus us saying, because you belong to that group, you should volunteer. They don't volunteer in their jobs. Yeah, I mean, talking like a $20 gift card, you know, um, to Walmart or to, you know, something that each time to really make it worth something that helps them, plus making sure there's child care available. Um, but, you know, getting and then getting foundations to help provide funding to other organizations to get resources to participants so that they can actually drive the organization. I think wow. of like I volunteered at Heart Ministry for a year. I went there about once a week, but all the families I met there and any number of those families could be brought into a, a role like that quite easily, but you sure want to compensate them somehow to make it, um, you know, productive for them and for, for you. You're getting a lot out of their participation. You should compensate them for it, and we would get tons of good feedback from somebody with those lived experiences. I, I work with people. 17 different countries and each one's going to have a different important perspective but you gotta you can't just expect them to show up um one thing uh, that i have noticed is that funders do seem to be more willing to um allow you to budget for 
um, paying people for their lived experience. So for example, we got a, a grant recently from uh, Humanity, Nebraska Humanities, Humanities in Nebraska, I'm never sure what order it is, but uh, in our budget, we included funding for uh, to, to pay for people to share their lived experiences in these kinds of conversations like we're having today. Um, and so that is something that seems new to me um, that that that's like a you know a line item in in the budget that now is allowable and wasn't so much the case even just five or eight years ago. Well, so, I think if you go to the funding organizations and talk to them about that strategy, then they would maybe they could start making those accommodations because that's what I think the message I got out of the book is there are huge amounts of resources out there in these foundations, but you know, unless it's guided by the right um, people, it's, it's, it's not, it's that whole colonized approach that's not ever gonna work. You know, the other thing we gotta be sensitive to is I was in a, a court improvement project where the, the Supreme Court brought in a number of Native Americans to talk about how the court treated them. And everyone who attended that meeting, they gave them a gift card, I don't know if it was 40 or $50, I was there part of my job, so obviously I didn't take it, but you got to be discreet about who you're going to give the money to because there's some folks who definitely are on their job or their middle income, they don't need it. But if you can pigeonhole or find the very people you want and say, hey, this is a gift card, but I want to be careful with that because more, more times than, than many, we need people to be there more than just once. So uh, Paul, my point is someone who have lived experience, they can probably help legal aid, Humanities Nebraska, they can have all these organizations that fund different entities and they could be credible messengers more than just one meeting. But again, not that they're professionals, but they're people who can say, hey, I know the lay of the land because I live in that community or I experience economic hardship or I have a hard time getting across town through public transportation. Uh, those are the kind of people we want brought to the table. And some of these people volunteer anyway, but again, I think we gotta be careful not to take advantage of them, which is what many of these nonprofits will do. They expect the poor and people of color who have been fighting these struggles to do it out of goodwill, when at the same time they're getting paid and making money and this ARAPA funds or this COVID-19 funds shows us exactly how the carpet baggers come out of the, the carpets and they basically have never set foot in these respective communities and so on. So those are part of the issues I think this book speaks to and we should continue to lift that up and talk about it as we've done so tonight. Any yeah, other once feedback? You get, John, once you get uh, people in the room, then how do you, protect them from being shoved to the side. Okay. Someone has to, someone has to be the ambassador. Be quiet. Beg your pardon, Sammy, say it again. I said they will expect those new people, you know, we gave you a stipend and you got a meal and your kids are okay. So just sit there and be quiet. We have to challenge that. We have to actually, matter of fact, just look at the minutes of many of these nonprofits, whether it be legal aid, humanities, uh, Habitat for Humanity, uh, community alliance and all of them, and you can see that oftentimes their minutes or their board minutes don't reflect the very things we're talking. So if you got board minutes and it's documented, you would know if they've been pushed to the side and we actually include them. Jack, I see your hand is up. Yeah, I just wanted to do a mic check. Can you hear me? I hear you well. I hear you well. Your mic is working well. The guy, the mic guides are with you. Okay. Uh, if I can speak for a moment. Uh, the only way... <laughs> Going back in history quite a, a long ways, uh, the only way that Karl Marx was able to do his research and writing was because he happened to stumble across a factory owner by the name of Engels, who funded me, him for pretty much the rest of his life. Um, there aren't that many people around who are willing to fund challenges to the system. Uh, I think it's it's... I think personally, I think it's a big waste of time to try to figure out how to get money to uh, just to, to take down the system. Uh, that's it, it isn't going to work that way. I think what needs to happen is to begin doing things that are challenging to the system, and hopefully uh, there may be people with at least a little bit of money who can who are willing to fund that that kind of approach. Gotcha. Gotcha. Feedback. Thank you. Other reactions? Boy, we're within an hour here, folks. Any other no other comments? Any other?
things because we could wind down. Uh, we can go from there. Well, can can we um, do? Do people here in this? I know this is a small group, but um, uh, do we have some potential next steps or other? new directions we might be able to go in with this conversation to extend it and uh, you know see what kind of impact um, we can have? Well, Karen, let me ask you that question directly back. When it first started, you thought at one point we would get the donor community or those people who give out wealth or whatever they give out uh, to read the book. Would it be a possibility that more being, uh, again, under the direction of support with Lindsay, direct a letter to them and say, hey, the very questions we raised today, how many people on your board of directors who are either direct recipients or live in those target areas that you fund, that's one. And then number two, how do you know the effectiveness of uh, not doing this great white savior stuff? Is that a possibility that we could do collectively? Yeah, and I think, um, you know, as I was thinking more about it, I think I, I like the idea of uh, outside pressure. And I think the best place for outside pressure to come is from the people who are not getting funded or who are getting funded. So if if we could get some executive directors and board members and uh, you know people representing philanthropies to come to the table, a combination like that, a, a mixed group, as it were, um, so that, you know, so that philanthropists need to answer to the community that they're funding at the same time that they're having the conversation, I think would be the, you know, a possible way to do it. Thoughts on that? By the way, that's how the Shirley Temple uh, Theater got built was that the, the, the criticism that came about what happens in the arts community got them so riled up that they came back and said, we'll pull it up instead of shut up. And uh, that's how they got raised those millions of dollars. I haven't heard nothing from them since the building's been up there. But my point is that came out of a sense of frustration of how the North Omaha or communities of color have been ignored historically in Omaha. So that is a good example of that model working. Anything else? Any other feedback? Karen, I just I appreciate that question and um, just appreciate the the next step that you offered too. Um, I would definitely like to continue this conversation because I think there's probably a lot of different avenues we can come to and a lot of different ways that, as as Villanueva says, like we can use our own medicine to really try to chip away at some of these systems. And that's a question that that I have that maybe we can like think about. And I don't know if we can come back together or what that looks like, but just what is our medicine on this screen as individuals and how collectively can we use our medicine to um, do ideas like you just suggested, or maybe others are like, ooh, that's not my space, but maybe there's a different space I can kind of come into. And so I I think coming back together at some point to to chat a little bit further um would would be really rewarding and just having conversations around what next steps actually look like after we maybe have time to process and yeah just think through things a little bit more yeah you know we're, we're getting close to the end and i want to be conscious of people's time and even the enthusiasm or at least the the bandwidth for us to do this but i, I heard very clearly that there's some feedback we're going to have on our web page or at least have part of this process an evaluation but we'd also maybe go back to your point karen you raise this how do we get some some movement based upon some of the comments you made, what Paul has made, and other people, Lindsay, so on and said so on, and do something with this? And then I do think going back to this conversation, or even the book, uh, at a later point, with maybe some different players at the table, how do you implement what has been said, or make it a real, or as they say, make it plain, so that we can say something came out of it? And again, going back to Jack's comment, sometimes systems are not going to react a certain way, and so you got to come at it from a whole different level. Or, or not even play game with the, the fakers. We're not going to do anything. So I like your point, Jack. That if you understand Karl Marx, part of what he was able to do what he did is he got funded by someone to do what he did. And so a lot of time grassroots folks don't get the, the luxury of sabbaticals and, and, and all those things that help them to be creative. So really good point. Anything else, uh, folks, that we want to say before we uh, close out? I know, Lindsay, did you want to say anything or anyone else uh, as we close down? Because I know we're at that point almost. Well, I just, Cynthia, did I see you unmute? Were you going to say something? 
Uh, well, I was thinking of the one board that I'm on and one of the requirements to get some of the grants that we pursued is that they have to have low income people on the board and they have to have a diversity of religions. So it's just, sometimes it's the grantor of the grant that can help create a board that has more diversity. Very good. And by the way, I know back in the day, the Buffett uh, Foundation, not the, but the Sherwood Foundation, put a lot of pressure on nonprofits to make their boards much more inclusive to the LGBTQ plus community by saying, do you have policies? Do you have people on your staff, on your board? And you'd be surprised the number of people and organizations that made those changes because they wanted some of those funds. And I know at Promise Ship, it was one of those policy discussions we had. Uh, I do know that NAM got a little bit more support uh, as an organization, because they also advance that as an organization, or you're a member of NAM, things like that. So if you can get those donor communities to use that carrot a little bit, it also can help change the scope of some of these organizations we're talking about, but I really like that. Thank you. And I, I would add simply that um, I've been on this particular board since 1917, and I just renewed, committed, I'd be on for three more years. <sighs> But anyway, um, I've seen people come and go who represented that diversity. And the reasons they couldn't come to meetings was either their classes changed in school or their kids needed to be taken care of or they didn't have transportation. So those things you talked about were of interest to me and I'll somehow get it to the group I'm with. Good. The other thing, Paul, going back to your point that was made earlier is that sometimes you have to help train people on some of the things, how to ask tough questions on board. I've been on board where people sit there as if they were an icon or they wouldn't say anything. And so it's one thing to be on a board that deals with fiduciary issues or community issues. But again, you just don't want to take somebody right off the streets without having a little bit of understanding the climate of that board. And back in the day, United Way had the Heartland Blueprint, they called it, where they actually trained grassroots folks to be on boards, usually training. They really orientated them on what to expect. And some organizations actually incorporated some of that, but it went Went by the wayside, United Way retreated and stopped doing that. And I don't know why, but again, it was a way of making sure our boards in Omaha particularly were more diverse. But again, these are the conversations hopefully we'll see happen more in our community. Anybody? Well, uh, yeah. well I think it's that thing you keep talking about um, when it comes to getting the community involved in, in discussions like you had with um, Mr. Riley. And getting, you know, it's not just board, it's not just organizations that need the community input. It's it's governmental organizations, but there's definitely no way that they're going to pay for. Uh, there could be though, maybe if it, if there's a legislation put into place where uh, community um, advisory councils are paid to consult with, like the director of prisons, and you have to have people with lived experience on that advisory. Council. There is one for solitary confinement, but nobody's really compensated for it. But you put people on a board like that that are going to meet with the prosecutor or the police department or or the director of corrections or foster care, build it into legislation. It can be set up. I like that. Linda, I see your hand is up, Linda. Linda? Yes, yes. Um, I'm not on a board and I don't work with boards, but I was struck by the uh, someone's comment about uh, looking at ourselves in the mirror. And I've been a Unitarian for almost 60 years. And our denomination is struggling with um, how we reach out to uh, communities of color, because we are mostly white people living in white silos. <laughs> And um, I'm one of the things that I'm very interested in is helping so-called liberals in our church to understand that the structural white supremacy is a part of all of our lives. Because uh, when people say, I, when white people say, I'm not a racist, Mm, come on, we live in a structurally racist um, environment. And so a couple of, uh, I grew up in Texas in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, which is even then was not your bastion of liberal thought. And um, 
I, in my early 20s, I had a very loud discussion with my parents and I made the comment, it's wrong to be prejudiced. And my father said to me, that is not what we taught you. Hmm. Wow. And so I've been processing that conversation for the last 50 plus years. And one promise I made to myself was that I would sit down almost daily and try to do a self-examination of hidden racism in my life. That's not easy to do because when you discover incidents or whatever, it's hard to deal with, but that's the only way you can grow. And I wrote a little essay to try to process some of this called <laughs> The Spanking of Linda about a series of events in my growing up years where I broke the color line out of you know, just being an innocent child, whether it was drinking from the colored water fountain in Sears or sitting in the restricted seating area at the bus station. Um, and I shared this with my pastor and she recommended a book to me. So I decided to subtitle uh, my uh, essay, The Spanking of Linda, how I learned to be white in the book that Cynthia might want to add to her bibliography is learning to be white. And I thought, oh my God, this author just wrote my my biography. But one of the re one of the ways the white community uh, imposes racism is through shame. Oh, if you do this, you can't be part of the family. If you do this, your church will kick you out. Both of those things have happened to me. And so I think that we need to do work both within the organizations and outside the organizations to deal with the non-responsiveness of boards or whatever organization, whether it's a church or a women's group or whatever. So, so here's the question, Linda, I know we're getting ready to close down is, what we're also looking at with evaluations, give us examples of how you would do that, or even as you shared your testimonial or your feedback now, how do you help other whites or folks to come to deal with their own education they got? Because again, any of us who work in different circles have listened and experienced people who don't come to grips or have self actualization as you just shared about. So maybe that's something we could look at as a later agenda we can deal with. Because again, obviously today we focus on the book, but I really appreciate what you had to say. Cynthia, I see your hand is up. I just want to know if Linda knows about next week at Augustana Lutheran. Uh, uh, a time for burning, a time for building. Um, I've seen a time for burning, but I haven't seen a a time uh, for burning. yeah. And I was gonna I was gonna make a shameless plug as I always do. I use the word but shameless. I, I plug. have to leave, but I, I'm glad you're gonna make the plug. I I've right. got two people right. coming with me. Yeah. Okay, and we're ready to round down. But I know Paul would be in my case if I didn't, and Paul's gonna do something I think thereafter. But folks, we have a showing next week at Augustine Lutheran Church called A Time for Building, which is kind of a follow up on a time for burning, and basically it's the white a group that's discussing the video and their experiences. There's many clips from A Time for Burning, and we're going to show it at the church where it originally was shown over 50 some years ago. And then secondly, uh, we want to have maybe a discussion of where have we come from today. Yours truly is going to be the moderator. Uh, Paul is going to say some word as well as another participant is going to say something. And then we also have the pastor of the church, current pastor, uh, share some some comments and then we're going to just have a discussion about where do we go from here after watching that video so that's next week wednesday uh from six o'clock to eight and the video is available on our website now and then we will show uh the whole clip video from six to seven and then start the discussion thereafter uh and the discussion should last probably about 30 to 45 minutes uh, after the introductory remarks from the people who will talk right after the video. So that's something that more is per, 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 uh, co-hosting uh, next week with Augustine Luther Church and others. And Paul is the one who brought it to my attention. And so really amazed with that video and hopefully that'll help us continue this conversation. Hey, Linda, if you, Linda, can you see if you can spread the word about that to your pastor? 
Um, Cause I thought you first Unitarian would definitely, they've already done some work uh, across racial lines with, uh, I know uh, first United Methodist or uh, Claire Memorial, I think. And yes, Claire Memorial is our sister church. And uh, so we've done some joint activities together. I'm on the beloved community um, uh, social justice team, so I can uh, promote well, well, that. And we can share with all the folks we need to. But yeah, let me wind down and say, folks, I thank you for being here tonight. We're right up on our time. Uh, it's been a, a, a robust discussion on the issues of the book. Uh, appreciate uh, uh, Lindsay bringing this to our attention. Appreciate your participation. And uh, we'll hopefully we'll get an edited version of this on our website so that other people can hear the things we've said today. And then if you have other books or things, one of the goals for more for 2024 is to bring other people, encourage them, not necessarily to buy books for all Jamal to read, but buy books where we can get people involved and in doing more of these kind of discussions. Lindsay, that was a crack. Uh, for people to bring more discussions about books that help us to be much more avid readers and hopefully deal with social justice related to reconciliation, race issues, and as Paul would always say, repentance and all the other good stuff that goes with healing. So hopefully you can join us again next time as we always end our show. Thank you very much and may the force be with you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank, hey, Ajmal, before you close up, make sure everybody... Uh, clicks that evaluation link before he shuts down the zoom where you won't be able to get get to it and if you do not get it and want to do it then we can email you a copy of it but we're trying to evaluate all our meetings for our funding source but also to get more people to participate and also those who want to sign up to do this kind of work because there's a lot of people in our state who want to do this but they don't know that sometimes we do this kind of work to help make our beloved community better thank you Barocco.